I turn to right and left in all the earth. I see no sign of justice, sense, or worth. A man does evil deeds, and all his days are filled with luck and universal praise. Another is good in all he does. He dies, a wretched, broken man, whom all despise. Gotarzis, meaning ox crusher in old Iranian, was labeled as the son and heir of Mithridates the Great in the Babylonian Astronomical Diaries. A relief at Beistun referred to his position under his father as Satrap of Satraps. When Mithridates died, Gotarzis would be proclaimed king in Babylon. He quickly appointed Mitratu as general in the city. The Parthians would continue to work their political ambitions through their vassal states, and Armenia would be no exception. Its king, Tigranes the Great, who Mithridates had installed, had imperial ambitions beyond being a mere puppet for the Parthians, and he resolved to bide his time. When Mithridates died, the Parthians had been weakened by years of Scythian invasions and internal bickering. He felt the time was right to initiate the process of expansion through plans he had spent years refining. Outwardly, he would continue to feign subservience to Gatarzes. For political stability on his northern borders, he married the daughter of Mithridates VI of Pontus, named Cleopatra the Elder. But when he had finalized his war plans in 87 or 86, he reacted swiftly and assuredly and recaptured the 70 valleys of Armenia that he'd given up just four years earlier laying waste to the Parthian lands adjoining the region in the process. The former territories of Osroene, Nisibis, Gordiene, Atropatene, and Adiabene all fell to the Armenian war machine. Under Tigranes the Great, the Armenian kingdom would connect to both the Caspian and Mediterranean seas. Only his alliance to Pontus through the marriage of the daughter kept Armenia from touching the Black Sea as well. However, Tigranes would take one flawed misstep. His father-in-law, Mithridates VI, who ruled Pontus, would enter into a war with the Romans, known as the Third Mithridatic War. The war was a legacy of the First and Second Mithridatic Wars, during which Mithridates slaughtered 80,000 Roman and Italian civilians in what is now known as the Asian Vespers. However, this was in response to Bithynia launching frequent and deadly raids into Pontus with the assistance of Roman mercenaries. Tigranes would object via diplomatic channels, but his pleas fell on deaf ears. In response, he decided to take justice into his own hands. The Roman Republic's response was predictable. Lucius Lucullus entered Pontus with five legions, numbering roughly 30,000 Roman infantry and 2,000 or so cavalry. Mithridates' general had lost a naval engagement to the Romans, and an assassination attempt on Lucullus had also failed. Mithridates next decided that if he could disrupt the Roman supply line, he could then engage the legions on dictated terms of his choosing. The Romans staved off the attack, and seeing an opportunity in a narrow valley, gave chase. The resulting conflict, now known as the Battle of Kabira. Mithridates, seeing defeat was inevitable, began to prepare to flee, which caused the complete and utter collapse of his army. Mithridates himself managed to escape, but the soldiers he left behind were killed to the last man. He felt his only option now was to enter Armenia under the protection of Tigranes, his son-in-law. Tigranes, as expected, refused to hand him over to the Romans. Lucullus therefore marched towards the Armenian kingdom's new unfinished capital of Tigranocerta in 69. Sources cite Armenia's force at over 200,000 men, which was likely inflated but there was a definitive numeric advantage for the Armenians. Tigranes likely felt confident as he approached the unfinished city. Lucullus, knowing his disadvantage, 
did not want to be besieged with his troops and took half of his roughly 12,000 men, leaving the rest to defend the city. In a surprising turn of events, Lucullus would be the victor despite the odds against him, and Tigranes would flee to the old capital of Artazada. Lucullus remained in pursuit, though, and again would defeat Tigranes. Before he could complete his victory in its entirety, he was recalled by the Senate, and Tigranes would surrender, becoming this time an ally of Rome. The condition being he had to give up the territory that he'd recently acquired, to which he, having no real choice, complied with. Gutarzis, meanwhile, would begin his reign as great king, rather than the honorific king of kings that his father had reinstated. Upon his death, evidence is not clear on who next sat on the throne, but there are competing hypotheses. By 80 BCE, we do know that Orides would ascend to the Parthian throne. The period of time when Orides, the son of Gutarzis, ascended is viewed by many as the Parthian Dark Ages. Evidence for this period is scarce and doesn't really pick up until the reign of Orides II in 57. Even this transition, though, is a bit murky. We know that Orides, along with his brother Mithridates IV, had murdered Phrahades III. Orides would originally support his brother, but the brothers would quickly fall out with each other. Orides, with the assistance of the House of Surin, revolted against his brother's rule. Both would simultaneously claim the title of King of Kings, but true to the adage of there can be only one, things would not end well. Orides initially had his brother on the run, with Mithridates fleeing to Roman-held Syria, specifically under the protection of Roman proconsul and governor of Syria, Aulus Gabinius. With this support, Mithridates would return and invade Parthia. Aulus even marched with him as far as the Euphrates before turning back to take care of trouble in Egypt. Even without Roman support, he was able to conquer Babylonia and oust his brother and take back the throne for but a brief period of time in early 54. He'd begin minting coins out of Seleucia, but later that year, he would be besieged by Orides' general from the house of Surin, Surina. He and his forces were initially able to hold out, but eventually were defeated and then executed by his brother. As was the right of the Surin clan, they would crown Orides king of kings. It was during this time that the Roman Republic was weaving its own political machinations, having dispatched their immediate foes, the Carthaginians, many decades earlier. They had begun to work their way through Greek territory. In just another 10 years, the former Diadochi lands of the Seleucids would cease to exist entirely, as would others like Cappadocia and Galatia. Far from being the at times belligerent upstart in the West, the Romans were now beginning to sow the respect they had so long craved. Not necessarily a respect born out of cooperation, rather one with fear and uncertainty at its foundation. Leading the Republic were three men in an arrangement of power called the First Triumvirate. They were Julius Caesar, Pompey, and Marcus Licinius Crassus. It's often made out that Crassus was a Roman aristocrat who had inherited his wealth and that he lacked military experience. This was not the case. To the contrary, Crassus's wealth was earned through clever and often unscrupulous business practices, but they were his. His military experience, on the other hand, simply overshadowed by the far more grandiose accomplishments of the other two. He'd also generally not been the prime strategist of previous campaigns he'd participated in. Crassus had fought with and led men from his early 20s. He'd commanded the right flank of Sulla's army during the First Civil War and spent much time chasing Spartacus before finally defeating him. Where Caesar and Pompey also succeeded above Crassus was with regards to their public relations and personas. Among the three, Crassus had no equal in business, but was woefully inept at generating positive publicity for himself. Also, at the age of now 60, 
he was growing increasingly desperate, knowing full well that the sands of time for him were running low. In 56, the three met and Crassus would co-consul with Pompey. Pompey would receive Hispania and Crassus Syria. The term, five years. Had Crassus simply kept to this arrangement, the end results may have been different. However, Crassus' desire to match the military victories of Caesar and Pompey were now almost all-consuming. He felt that the Parthian Empire that lay adjacent to his province of Syria would provide him with the recognition he needed, nay required. The riches they were said to be in possession of would merely be a convenient side benefit. He'd been in communication with the king of Armenia, Artavazdas II, who'd offered him 40,000 troops, consisting of 10,000 cataphracts and 30,000 infantrymen, with only one condition being the use of Armenian territory to better supply the army and get them there safely. Crassus, though, who as mentioned previously was experiencing an all-consuming desire to receive sole military honors, refused, choosing instead the more direct route through the Euphrates. Osroene, a kingdom ruled by a chieftain named Ariamnes, lay directly to Syria's north. Ariamnes had previously assisted Pompey, and Crassus trusted him at his word. So when Ariamnes urged Crassus to not delay and attack at once, and directly as the Parthians were currently in a much weakened state, he listened. Ariamnes, urging, sent Crassus directly into the most desolate and inhospitable part of the desert. At almost the same time, he received word from the Armenian king Artavasis that the Parthian army was currently in Armenia and required his assistance. Crassus, now drunk on the possibility of adding a massive region to the Republic, ignored him and continued on his march. Meanwhile, Orides, now aware of Armenia's treachery, divided his army. He had Surina track and harass Crassus in the dry lands. The objective, to disrupt Crassus' supply chain of food, water, and equipment by cutting him off from the existing sources that trailed him, and then directing him to areas where it could not easily be replenished. Surina would command a small number of just 9,000 Parthian horse archers and 1,000 cataphracts. While Surin was doing this, Orides would enter Armenia and punish them before meeting up with Surina's troops for what he felt might be a final encounter with the Romans. However, Orides did not anticipate the success that Surin would have in the Badlands. And that famous battle will be in the next episode. If you like this video, please hit the like button. Please consider subscribing. And as always, cheers. Till the next video.